Wonderland was wonderful, Donna. Uh -huh. Mad, but wonderful. But Madeline lives in Paris. Paris. That's a Wonderland that's real. All I needed to do to get to Wonderland was to fall down a rabbit hole or step through the mirror. But let's face it, it takes money to get to Paris. Why does Paris have to be so far away? Far away? Oh, but no, mademoiselle. This is Paris. Oh, oh my. Excuse me for jumping like that, but I've never seen a mouse with a beret and briefcase before. Bear with me to introduce myself. I am Francois. And I am a business mouse. I am conducting the Duval cheese survey to find out which type of cheese prefers the people living in this part of Paris. How curious. I'm afraid you aren't in Paris at all. Sacre. I must have made the wrong sick in the sack sick of the tunnel. You really came here from Paris? Mais oui, mademoiselle. Now, if uh, you will only please tell me your favorite cheese, I am the very busy mouse. You're supposed to be polite to visitors, even mice. Don't worry, Monsieur Francois. Dinah doesn't really care for French food. What a pity that the cat is not born with the taste for fine cheese. If you will just tell me your favorite cheese, I can finish the survey report, and then zoop the zoop, I pedal the pump back to the Duval cheese factory. In Paris? Oui, oui, Paris, naturellement. Now, your favorite cheese, is it bleu, roquefort, camembert, bois de salut? But you must tell me something first. In Paris, do little girls really have adventures? Like in this book, let me read it to you. Oh, perhaps uh, Chantilly, uh, Oriental, uh, Pont l'Evêque, Girl Lindberger. In an old house in Paris, all covered with vines, <laughs> I know where well, is this little Madeleine. Ah, she is so full of the crackly pops. Oh, Francois, would you take me to Paris with you? I want to meet Madeleine. Hello, mademoiselle. I am conducting the cheese survey, not the travel bureau. All right. I'll tell you my favorite cheese if you'll promise to take me to Paris. Cheeseburgers. Cheeseburgers. Cheeseburgers! Ooh. It is the mouse for my little mouse. Oh, I'm cheese is my life, my love, my profession. The great cheese is like the great wine. It has be savor for itself alone. But cheeseburgers. Mm. What is your name, poor dear? But cheeseburgers are good. Alice. Please, Mademoiselle Alice, s'il vous plaît. You have much to learn. I come from the proud Mars family that knows their cheese. My great, great grandma was the great, great Anatole. Anatole? Oui, Anatole. A Mars among mice. A Mars across. In all of France, there was no happier Mars than Anatole. Thank you. 
He will cherish his opinion of mine. Pardon, monsieur. Allow me to introduce myself. A mouse. I am... Anatole. Anatole? A mouse? A mouse? Mme Claire, come quickly. Observe. He is Anatole. He's a mouse, monsieur. He is Anatole. Quickly, you know what to do. Oui, monsieur Duval. Oh, oh, thank you, then. Oh, oh, she is just in time. No, 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 monsieur. It is a mistake. Go away, s'il vous plaît. Go away. Wait, wait. Yes, in all of France, there was no happier mouse than Anatole. You can be proud of your great-great-grand-mouse, Monsieur Francois. I try, Mademoiselle Anis, to carry on the family tradition. At this very moment, I am blown with the grand inspiration. You, my dear, are lovely, charmant, graceful, and you know absolutely nothing about the cheese. In other words, you are perfect. If I know nothing in school, I'm never perfect. It's quite the other way around. I will take you to Paris. You shall taste all of our cheese, and you will tell me which one you like the best. You will be the perfect guinea pig. I beg your pardon. Did you say you would take me to Paris? Of course, on my bicycle. But can you manage? It's so tiny. It's really only a mousicle. Have no fear, Francois is here with the latest Duval Miracle Cheese. The secret ingredient is the same magic mushroom you ate in the Wonderland. You mean? Oui, oui. One little nibble, and you will be wingy tiny like me. Oh, it's just like my daddy says. It's the best if you can travel on business. Give me the magic cheese, Francois. You're all nibbly wibbly. Right over the head is the famous Raphael Tower. And here, exactly above us, is the Cathedral de Notre Dame. Isn't it thrilling? But, but I can't see anything. I didn't come to Paris just to ride through the sewers. I want to see Madeleine. She, I have the fear that we have come on the exact wrong moment. I forgot about the bad hat. Madeleine has a bad hat? No, no. The Spanish ambassador has the bad hat. Did Madeline ruin the ambassador's hat? No. The ambassador's little boy was always a bad hat. How curious. How can a boy be a hat? A bad hat, Alice. That is what he is. Do you know that he poked the little holes in the cheddar cheese I brought here? And then he told the little girl that it was sweet? That is the girl said she is good. And that is not the all. This little boy was a bad hat from the very first day he came to Paris. I will tell you the story. It started right here. In an old house in Paris, covered with vines, lived twelve little girls in two straight lines. 
They left the house at half past nine. In two straight lines, in rain or shine. The smallest one was Madeline. One day, the Spanish ambassador moved into the house next door. Look, my darlings, what bliss, what joy. His Excellency as a boy. Madeline said, it is evident that this little boy is a bad hat. In the spring, when birdies sing, something suddenly went zing, causing pain and shock surprise during morning exercise. On hot summer nights, he ghosted. In the autumn wind, he boasted as he flew the highest kite. Year in, year out, he was polite. He was sure and quick and nice. And Miss Clavel said, isn't he nice? One day, he climbed upon the wall and cried, Come, I invite you all. Come over sometime and I'll let you see my toys and my menagerie. My frogs and birds and bugs and bats. Squirrels, hedgehogs and two cats. The hunting in this neighborhood is exceptionally good. But Madeleine said, please don't molest us. Your menagerie does not interest us. He changed his clothes and said, I bet this invitation they'll accept. Madeleine answered, a torero is not at all our idea of a hero. The poor lad left. He was lonesome and blue. He shut himself in. What else could he do? But in a short while, the little elf was back again and his old self. Said Miss Clavel, it seems to me he needs an outlet for his energy. A chest of tools might be attractive. For a little boy, that's very active. I knew it. Listen to him play. Hammering, sawing, and working away. Oh, but that boy was really mean. He built himself a guillotine. He was unmoved by the last look the frightened chickens gave the cook. He ate them roasted, grilled, and frito. Oh, what a horror was Pepito. One day, when out to take the air, Madeleine said, Oh, look who's there. Pepito carried a bulging sack. He was followed by an increasing pack of all the dogs in the neighborhood. That boy is simply misunderstood. Look at him bringing those dogs his food. He said, let's have a game of tag and let a cat out of the back. There were no trees and so instead, the cat jumped on Pepito's head. My marchers listened to the poor boy crying, Oh, secure! To which you must cry if by any chance you ever need a help in France. Miss Clavel ran fast and faster to the scene of the disaster. She came in time to save the bad hat, and Madeleine took care of the cat. There was sorrowing and pain in the embassy of Spain. The ambassadress wept tears of joy as she thanked Miss Clavel for saving her boy. Nothing, said the ambassador, would cheer up poor Pepito more than a visit from next door. Only one visitor at a time. Will you go in first, Miss Madeline? So Madeline went in on tiptoe and whispered, 
Can you hear me, Pepito? It serves you right. You are a brat for what you did to that poor cat. I'll never hurt another cat, Pepito said. I swear to that. I've learned my lesson. Please believe I'm turning over a new leaf. That's fine, she said. I hope you do. We all will keep our eyes on you. And lo and behold, the former barbarian turned into a vegetarian. And the starling and turtle, the bunny and bat, went back to their native habitat. His love of animals was such, even Miss Clavel said, it's too much. The little girls all cried, boo-hoo. But Madeleine said, I know what to do. She said, you are our pride and joy. You are the world's most wonderful boy. They went on and broke their bread and brushed their teeth and went to bed. And as Miss Clavel turned on the light, she said, I knew it would all come out right. I knew it would come out all right, too. And now I want to meet Madeline myself. But, my chérie, first you make the promise that you will taste the double cheese and tell me which you like the best. I'll tell you right now. I just remembered my real favorite. Cottage cheese and jelly. Cottage cheese... Cottage cheese and jelly. Sacre bleu! I have made the girl boo-boo. This girl has no soul. For the cheese connoisseur. Cottage cheese and jelly is even worse than the cheese burger. Mon Dieu, I shall never smile again. I don't care if you smile or not. You promised to show me Paris. And if you don't, I won't eat any of your silly cheese at all. And if you don't stop frowning, your face will freeze that way. Just like the frowning prince. Ah, if I were a prince, instead of only a business mouse, I would never frown. I would smile all the time as I tasted every cheese in my kingdom. Well, I can tell you about a prince who always frowned and nothing could make him stop. Not even a fragrant slice of camembert? Not even that. He lived in a faraway land, even farther than Wonderland. One day, his father, the king, sat upon his throne, reading him a story. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there lived a beautiful princess with an irresistible smile. All who gazed upon it were forced to smile themselves. Nobody can make me smile. Look! Your face might stay like that, you know. It is staying like this. It won't move. Be quiet. And next to the kingdom of the smiling princess was another kingdom. I want that frown removed from your face immediately. It is a royal command. It is an immovable frown. It is not. It is so. There is no such thing. What is the trouble? Did you have a bad day at the wars? It was an excellent day. One glorious victory after another. I have an immovable frown. You have not. It will go away. How can that go away? We'll see. Send for the jesters. Send for the jugglers. Tumblers! 
looked at it. The tumblers did it. They shook the walls and cracked the glass. No, no. Anyway, I have an immovable frown. You have not. It's past my bedtime. There is no such thing as an immovable frown. There is no such thing as an immovable frown. There's no such thing as an immovable frown. There's no such thing as an immovable frown. I'm not going to the wards this morning. The Grand Wizard will know what to do about that. He can't do anything about it. Nobody can. One thing is certain. There is no such thing as an immovable frown. Your Majesty is right. Of course there is no such thing as an immovable frown. How do you know? No, I know for many reasons. For one, your father has just said so, and he is the king. Tell us what are the other reasons. Tell me, Your Majesty, just how did all this arise? Yesterday, I was reading the prince a story about a beautiful young princess who happened to have an irresistible smile. And I noticed I happen to have an immovable frown. And I have! You haven't! And the Grand Wizard agrees with me. That scowl of yours can be removed. Of course! Now, you call in somebody with an irresistible smile. Oh, it won't do any good. I really have got an immovable frown. You have not. It cracked the mirror in the throne room. Why not call in the princess? Unfortunately, the book says that the young princess with the irresistible smile lives in a kingdom that is far, far away. It is. The kingdom of yours is a faraway land, Your Majesty. And if two lands are both far away, they must be close to each other. But there is no kingdom nearby except the one we are having the wars with. Well, then that must be the very one. <laughs> Invite this other king and his family over for the weekend. What a pity we never have met socially. Since our great-grandfather's time, the wars have been going on without interruption. It seems like a great deal of bother merely to get rid of a frown. Look! What has he done to that potted plant? I only frowned at it. It was such a particularly healthy specimen, and besides, just before you arrived, I gave it an injection of my new miracle plant potion. That might explain it. Come! I have decided to call off the wars. The peace treaty is signed, sire. The wars are ended. I don't know what I'll do with my time from now on. Did you see the young princess? Yes, Your Majesty. I gazed upon the princess myself. She has an irresistible smile. Very good. Let us prepare to entertain our royal guests for the weekend. The princess has an irresistible smile. I'm still frowning. Smile, girl, smile. Ooh. Oh, oh, my. 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 Oh,
you explain this? It, it can't be explained. No frown can resist an irresistible smile. Except an immovable frown. Uh, you're right, Your Majesty. And the prince has one. That's what I kept telling you, see? He said so too. Give me my way and taste my cheeses. <laughs> my frown will go away too. Look, we are here. My business address. The Dural Cheese Factory. The most beautiful place in all of France. Is it not marvelous, Mademoiselle Lamy? It certainly is smelly. Oh, yes. The parfum de fromage. And now, you will take the little bites from each cheese and I will make the little notes. too much of the wine cheese. And in the dream, I was busy in the stomach, just like this. The royal physician came to see me. you to get well again. Is there anything your heart desires? Yes, I want the moon. If I can have the moon, I will be well again. Lord High Chamberlain, I want you to get the moon. If the Princess Lenore can have the moon, she will be well again. The moon? Yes, the moon. Get it tonight. Tomorrow at the latest. It just happens I have a list of things I have got for you in my time, Your Majesty. Let me see now. I've got uh, ivory and apes, uh, peacocks, rubies, opals, emeralds, black orchids, pink elephants, blue poodles, gold bugs, scarabs and flies of amber, hummingbirds, tongues, angels, feathers, unicorns, horns, giants, midgets, mermaids, troubadours, minstrels, and dancing women, a pound of butter, two dozen eggs, and a sack of sugar. <laughs> Sorry, my wife wrote that in there. I don't remember any blue poodles. It says blue poodles right here on the list, and they are checked off a little check mark, so there must have been blue poodles. Never mind the blue poodles. What I want now is the moon. But the moon is out of the question, Your Majesty. It is 35,000 miles away, and it is bigger than the room the princess lies in. It furthermore, it is made of molten copper. I cannot get the moon for you. Blue poodles, yes. The moon, no. Royal wizard, I want you to get the moon for the Princess Lenore. I have worked a great deal of magic for you in my time, Your Majesty. Now, let's see. I have squeezed blood out of turnips for you, and turnips out of blood. I have produced rabbits out of silk hats, and silk hats out of rabbits. I have conjured up flowers, tambourines and doves out of nowhere, and nowhere out of flowers, tambourines and doves. I have given you seven league boots, the golden touch, and a cloak of invisibility. I got horns from Elfland, and gold from the rainbow. 
What I want you to do now is get me the moon. The Princess Lenore wants the moon, and when she gets it, you'll be well again. Impossible. It is 150,000 miles away. It is made of green cheese, and it is twice as big as this palace. Nobody can get the moon. Royal mathematician, I don't want to hear all the things you have figured out for me since 1907. I want you to figure out how to get the moon for the Princess Lenore. When she gets the moon, she will be well again. I'm glad you mentioned all the things I have figured out for you since 1907. It so happens that I have a list of them with me. Now, let me see. I have figured out for you the distance between the horns of a dilemma, night and day, and A to Z. I have computed how far is up, how long it takes to get away, and what becomes of gone. I know where you are when you're at sixes and sevens, the price of the priceless, and how many birds you can catch with the salt in the ocean, 187. 7,796,123, if it would interest you to know. I don't want to hear about 700 million imaginary birds. I want you to get the moon for the Princess Lenore. But, Your Majesty, the moon is 300,000 miles away. It is round and flat like a coin, only it is made of cardboard, and it is half the size of this kingdom. Furthermore, it is pasted on the sky. Nobody can get the moon. <laughs> do for you, Your Majesty. Nobody can do anything for me. The Princess Lenore needs the moon, but nobody can get it for her. Every time I ask anybody for the moon, it gets larger and further away. They are all wise men, and so they must all be right. If they are all right, then the moon must be just as large and as far away as each person thinks it is. The thing to do is find out how big the Princess Lenore thinks it is. I never thought of that. I will go and ask her, Your Majesty. Have you brought the moon to me? Not yet, but I will get it for you right away. Uh, how big do you think it is? It is just a little smaller than my thumbnail. For when I hold my thumbnail up at the moon, it just covers it. And how far away is it? It is not as high as the big tree outside my window, for sometimes it gets caught in the top branches. It will be very easy to get the moon for you. I will climb the tree tonight when it gets caught in the top branches and bring it to you. What is the moon made of, Princess? Oh, it's made of gold, of course, silly. Anybody knows that. what you have asked me to make. You have made the moon. Oh, the moon is 500,000 miles away. And it's made of bronze and round like a marble. That's what you think. Keep the Princess Lenore from seeing the moon in the sky tonight. Think of something. I know just the thing. Maybe we can make some dark glasses for the Princess Lenore. And then she will not be able to see the moon when it shines in the sky. If she wore dark glasses, she would bump into things. Then she would be ill again. We must hide the real moon from Princess Lenore. How are we going to do that? I know what we can do. We can stretch some black velvet curtains on poles, like a circus tent. Then the Princess Lenore would not see the moon in the sky. Curtains would keep out the air so the Princess Lenore would not be able to breathe and she would be ill again. We must do something so the Princess Lenore will not see the moon tonight. If you know so much, figure out a way to do that. I have it! We can set off fireworks in the gardens every night. We'll make a lot of silver fountains and golden cascades, and then the Princess Lenore will not be able to see the moon. Fireworks would keep the Princess Lenore awake. She would not get any sleep at all, and she would be ill again. Look, the moon is 
light already shining into the Princess Lenore's bedroom. Who can explain how the moon can be shining in the sky when it is hanging on a golden chain around her neck? Who explained how to get the moon when your wise men said it was too large and too far away? It was the Princess Lenore. She seems to know more about it than they do, so I will ask her. Tell me, Princess Lenore, how can the moon be shining in the sky when it is hanging on a golden chain around your neck? That's easy, silly. When I lose a tooth, a new one grows in its place, doesn't it? And when the royal gardener cuts the flowers, other flowers come to take their place. Of course. I should have thought of that. It's the same way with the daylight. And it is the same way with the moon. I guess it's the same way with everything. you tell me which is your favorite moon? Uh, she's... Francois, you are a one-track mouse. Oh, they're all okay, I guess. But how can I be sure till I've tried them in a cheeseburger? Oh, no, no, not again with your cheeseburgers. I will be a disgrace to my family, to Monsieur Duval, to France. I am ruined. Now you're frowning again. But really, Francois, all of your cheeses are just fine. When I grow up, I'm sure I'll learn to like them. But now, can I please go to visit Madeline? Ah, bien, little lady. Let us go. But wait. We are just now passing the Gypsy Carnival, where I myself last saw the little Madeline. But this isn't where Madeline lives. Oh, but I saw her here with my own little beady mouse eyes. I was studying the cheese-eating habits of the gypsy camp, and I see the whole thing. Of course, the story starts in that same little house all covered with vines, where live the little girls in two straight lines. They left the house at half past nine. The smallest one was Madeline. In another old house that stood next door, lived the son of the Spanish ambassador. Pepito's parents were away. He had no one with whom to play. Please come. I invite you all to a wonderful gypsy carnival. these things. You'll eat in bed. Good heavens, where is Madeline? and away they went. For gypsies do not like to stay. They only come to go away.
surely be shot. Pepito said, no work and all play. It's no fun if you have to do it all day. Oh, look, Pepito, here comes someone we know. Dear Miss Clavel, at last we found you. Please let us put our arms around you. until I see Madeline. It's my dream to be like her. Ah, we all have the dreams, little Alice. I dream that I will make the cheese so perfect, so delicate, so delicious, that it will be known all over the world as fromage François. You dream you could live in Paris and have adventures like little Madeline. What do you think is Madeline's dream? Quickly, or you will not be able to get through the mouth hole. 